Awesome. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you all for coming also for joining us today. And for those that are watching us, um, today's the 17th, and we're going to continue uh, where we left off on uh, correctly rightly uh, dividing, rightly dividing the, the scriptures. Mm -hmm. um, and today we're, we're doing part nine. Uh, I'm Gilbert, Gilbert Gomez, and of course here with the with the most famous pastor, Robert Pena, yeah. right? In my family. And um, <laughs> so, but but before we get started, we kind of just want to um, mention a, a few reminders. Uh, for one, we have the, the conference coming up this weekend, so it's something that we've been looking forward to, something that we're excited for. Uh, we're having Dove all the way up north from Amarillo mm -hmm. joining us. Um, we're also having Michael Dalton, who is from California. Um, and of course, Ryan Pena from the house. And these three three gentlemen are just um, mighty voices in the kingdom. You know, I, yeah. I, I don't want to exaggerate, but at the same time, I got to give honor where honor is due. Yeah. Um, these these men definitely uh, tap into to God's heart and, and just bring revelation. And so, <clears throat> so for those that, that will be attending here at Church of Acts, we ask that you register online at coatc.org. Okay, coatc.org. But for those of you that plan on, on maybe they can't make it or you're out of town and you want to watch it, we're going to be live streaming it. But you don't need to register for that. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So we're going to stream it either way. But for those that will be attending, we're asking for registration because we want to make sure that we have enough seats and everybody's mm -hmm. not standing. Now, yeah. if you do happen to stand, and that just shows me that you are super hungry for, for mm -hmm. what, what God, God is doing. Mm -hmm. Amen. So... But nonetheless, we don't, want to, uh, we don't want to keep anybody from receiving, whether you're in person or you're online. So we will be live streaming on YouTube and, of course, on, on Facebook as well. So um, any of those platforms, you could definitely catch us on. Uh, so you don't want to miss it. We're going to be having four sessions um, Friday night at 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. okay? And then Saturday morning at 11 and also Saturday night at 7 p.m. Okay? And then Sunday morning... We'll, we'll end it off at 11, uh, kind of like a regular service, but it's, mm -hmm. it's part of, of, of the conference on that Sunday morning yeah. at 11. Um, anything I missed on that? No, that's about it. Okay. Good news. Good deal. Well, I'll let you go ahead and, and, and launch this, this session today. All right, we'll do it. Again, <clears throat> 1,500 years of writing, 40 different authors. So the three things that we've been trying to drive into your spirit when you're reading scripture is historically, contextually, and hermeneutically. To simplify it, what was the author's mind to the people he was addressing? Secondly, that of the contextual, that means what, what was the context that he was talking about? That's so why there's such a huge misunderstanding with just that one chapter, Matthew 24. Um, and then, again, hermeneutically, which simply means how you interpret what the author was saying. There's things that Jesus told the religious leaders of his day that did not, did not pertain to anyone else. So you have to be very careful. You know, I, I hear evangelism today that try to go out there and tell the people that are ignorant of the word that the Bible is God's complete word and will, which is not true. There are many things in Scripture that were never the will of God, that God never spoke. So to say that the Bible is God's word and God's will, it is the complete word of God. As Jesus was being tested in Luke chapter 4, when he said, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that continually comes out of the Father. So realizing all this, again, 1,500 years. That's a long time. How many know that in those 1,500 years, there was a lot of different history that changed from one hand to the other? 
and then 40 different authors? What was it that was in their mind that they wanted to convey? For example, in the book of Revelation, when you find the seven letters to the churches of uh, uh, Asia, understand this. The language that John brought forth, they understood. Because they came out of the book of Ezekiel, Jeremiah. So when the people in Asia Minor began to hear and to read what John the Revelator was declaring, they knew that language. Mm -hmm. So we cannot go in our evangelism and bring anything of the Old Testament, anything of the Old Covenant, and say that it pertains to us today. That's wrong history. So this is what I want to share tonight. <clears throat> Why is it that when we study Scripture, in especially the transitioning of the old to the new that Jesus was doing that would end, it would actually end in 70 AD. Why was it that the religious leaders of his day were the worst crowd to convince? And why of all places, which was the synagogue, which was the teaching of Scripture, Remember in Luke chapter 4, Jesus walked in to the synagogue and the servant handed over the book of Isaiah. And the Lord immediately, of course, it's not like it's written in, in, in Scripture here, but he went to the place of Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, that is to us. And he said, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He has anointed me. And after he shares it, he brings the scroll back to its place, gives it to the servant, sits down and says, this day has this scripture been fulfilled in your ear. And you know what they came up with? This is the synagogue, the place of teaching the Torah. They had the scrolls of Isaiah. So what was it that they finally concluded with? Oh, that's the son of Joseph and Mary. They missed it entirely. So when you look at the three and a half years of the Lord's ministry, because it says that when he went to the baptism of John, he was at the, about the age of 30. So as he goes, he's got three and a half years to pour out with the only message that he ever, ever had, and that was the message of the kingdom. He had no other message, the parables. Every example that he gave was towards the kingdom. So as we look at this, again, the religious leaders, we know that they knew that the time had come for the arrival of the Messiah. How do we know that? Well, when you go to the Gospel of John, it says there, so are you that prophet? Are you that one that was to come? And what did John the Baptist say? He said, no, I am the voice crying out in the wilderness. He was quoting to them Isaiah chapter 40. So they said, well, if you're not the prophet, then are you that one that we were waiting for? So that tells you that they were already knowing that the coming, because they had the scriptures. They had the messianic Psalms. They had all the prophecies of the coming of the Messiah. And yet they never saw him. That's why I love the uh, example in Luke, I believe it's 20, 23, where he met up with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and he expounded to them all Scripture in Psalms, in the Law, and in the Prophets of where it was written of him. So notice, they never saw him in the Psalms. They never saw him in the Prophets. And they never saw him in the law. They were blinded to it. Now Paul picks that up in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, where he says, Till this day, when they read of the words of Moses, they still read it with their, va their faces veiled. Now remember, there was a veil, and it was ripped 
when Jesus said, uh, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit, there in Matthew 27, but the veil was not destroyed until 70 AD. This is why everything of the finished work of the cross, when Jesus proclaimed one of the seven sayings, and he said, Father, it is finished. That finished work had to be done before 70 AD because in the, in the burning of the temple, the records, the genealogy would be destroyed. But remember this, in Luke chapter 3, when they saw John, I mean, that of Joseph and Mary, they led the lineage of Joseph all the way to Adam, the son of God. It was right there. Where? In the temple. All they had to do is, okay, if this guy is the Messiah, let's go follow his lineage. They could have followed Joseph there in Luke chapter 3, verse 23. Now, Jesus himself began his ministry at about, about the age of 30, being was espoused, I mean, supposed to be the son of Joseph, the son of Heli, or Heli, the son of Madhat, and then go all the way down to verse 38, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. He was all there. What more proof do you want? This is why at, at uh, 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed, so were the records. Therefore, no one could prove that they were of the priesthood. Therefore, they couldn't start any more sacrifices. Now, stay with me. So, all these things that spoke of him. Now, remember, the Jewish people saw a lot of shadows, a lot of types, a lot of pictures of the one that was to come. But just looking at Jesus, the things that were being fulfilled that no one else was doing, no one was going in the streets healing the sick, casting out devils, raising the dead. He was the one back in Matthew chapter 4 when he says, repent, change the way you think. I'm about to express the kingdom. And if you continue to think the way that you've normally thought, you're going to miss it entirely. And they did. So when we see this, remember at the dedication, Simeon spoke to the Lord and said, Lord, that's enough. Take me home. And he said, you will not leave until you see the salvation of the Lord. And he told him, today, led by the Spirit, he was led to the temple. And basically saying, look for a couple with a blue blanket. It's a boy. Joseph and Mary walk in. Simeon and Anna begin to prophesy. I mean, they were prophesying. And even Simeon said, Lord, mine eyes have seen your salvation. Now, again, as a teacher, I pick up these things. Your salvation. Claiming as a Jew that what he had seen thus far of the salvation of the Jews was nothing. All the sacrifices, rituals, ceremonies, celebrations, festivals, Sabbaths. He said, no, Lord, now I have seen your salvation. That was a huge statement for a Jewish man watching over the temple. And Anna again began to prophesy, but all they ever saw them as was Joseph and Mary, the mother of Jesus. As a matter of fact, I go on to say, even Mary didn't know. What did she say? Lord, according to thy will, let your word be fulfilled. Which tells you what? She had no idea. Therefore, the wise men, Matthew chapter 2, the wise men didn't go to the stable as the shepherds did. They were in a house, Matthew 2.11. 
Even their gifts, Gilbert, even their gifts depict his Messiahship. They brought him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, royalty, he was the king. Frankincense, the priestly. That's the, what they used, the, the ointment that they used. And then the myrrh representing his suffering. So even the wise men who followed a new star went and it landed on a house where Joseph and Mary were. They gave him all of these gifts. Now, you know, the Christmas song, We Three Kings of Orient Are. Let me tell you, if the Jews thought he was the Messiah, ain't only three coming. They're going to have a whole city full. Mm -hmm. But anyway, even the, even the gifts that they gave unto the Lord spoke of his Messiahship. Now, in, uh, again, Luke chapter 4, in the place of studying the Scripture, when they gave the Lord the word of Isaiah, they didn't catch it. And I, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. The word, Christ, walks into the place of the teaching of the word, they hand him the word of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. He declares the word, sits down and says, this word is being fulfilled right before your very eyes and ears. And they went, huh? Oh, that's the son of Joseph and Mary. They missed it entirely. So again, in the transitioning, because, you know, I, I always thought, when somebody asks me, where does the New Testament begin? It begins in Matthew. The genealogy, going back to Abraham, son of David. But that's not true. Because in chapter 8, I believe, when the Lord saw the ten lepers healed, he said, go show yourself to the priest. That's Leviticus chapter 14. So why is he, if that's the New Testament, why is he telling them, to go to an Old Testament ritual if it's the New Testament because there was a transitioning. The whole three and a half years was a transitioning of the old to the new. So not until the burning of the temple where the temple veil was destroyed. But remember, Hebrews 10, 20 says this, his body was the veil. So when that veil was ripped it was not ripped for us to come in, but it was for God to come in us. That's, that's amazing truth. So then, <clears throat> I hear so much evangelism, and I'm going to tell you something. When you study it long enough, clear enough, and it becomes your language, the language of the kingdom, you will hear evangelists crying out in the streets, and you will pick it up in your spirit immediately. You say, that's not new covenant. Nope, that's not new covenant. So again, the danger of saying that this, this Bible, this book, that all of it is the word of God and the will of God, and that everything in here is God's word, it causes people to pull out of Scripture, out of context, and bring it into a topic of discussion as if though it was a part of that context and it, it was never, ever meant to be or to be read that way. Yeah. So they missed the entire interpretation. <clears throat> so now, the veil. When Adam fell, He could not see God the same anymore. Could not see Eve the same anymore. He said, it was that woman that you gave me. What was the first word prior to that? This is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Now he's veiled, and because of the veil, he cannot see God the same, and now cannot see Eve or anyone else the same. Now, I say that to say this. <clears throat> the, 
the law. Works of the law. Religion will always cause you to fall short or to feel that you're still lacking because religion cannot suffice. Only the truth. So if our evangelism today would just stick with the new covenant, remember what Jesus said in Matthew 27, drink this cup, for this cup hey, is the blood of, of that new covenant that I'm making with you. So we cannot go and pull out something of the uh, Noe covenant. Have you ever heard the this, this, this statement? Uh, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be, you know, in the last days. That, that's not scriptural. That's not true. You're taking that out of context. And if somebody argues with you, take them to 1 Peter chapter 3, where Jesus went to the prison where those that drowned in rebellion and disobedience in the flood of Noah, he set up a pulpit, preached to them, and he set them free. They said, Lord, we want you. <laughs> that is amazing. And Peter declares it, that he went and he set them free. So when somebody tells you, well, when a person dies, it's over with, um, I beg to differ. Because Peter says it twice that he went and preached to the dead. Now, so anything that we add to the new covenant is a misrepresentation. Mm -hmm. Now, under the law, under the old covenants, in the Old Testament, they could not actually represent God for who he was because of the veil. And yet, Enoch walked with God. Abraham saw the day of Jesus. I mean, the dream and interpretation of the dream that Daniel gave to Nebuchadnezzar, there throughout Scripture, Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah says, you know, Lord, the earth is filled with nothing but unclean lips, and heaven is declaring the glory of the Lord. So an angel had to take a coal to come and cleanse his lips to get him to say what heaven was declaring. See, heaven does not look at us as we look at heaven. You understand that? Heaven sees us in a way that God sees us. So under laws, under old covenants, under old uh, uh, scriptures, you're not going to be able to see God for who He rightfully is. Now, let me give Gilbert a chance here. So hold on, Gilbert. <clears throat> Another thing in the addition of the New Covenant, Hebrews 8, 13 says this, He has made the first obsolete. He has made the first obsolete. Why is there still so much argument of women in ministry? when they were the first apostles. Whoa. Somebody just shut off their internet. <laughs> they were. An apostle has to see the Lord. The women were the first ones to see him at the resurrection. So the apostles went to tell the disciples. And they became apostles. So all this argument, again, picking and choosing out of old covenants that there were five of and the Lord made the sixth covenant, but they pick and pull and they bring a misrepresentation because under those covenants, they could not see the Lord clearly. And yet Abraham did. That's amazing. So I'm going to end with this. <clears throat> In John chapter 3, Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, came by night, he didn't want to be seen, to talk to Christ. <clears throat> when the Lord told him, you have to be born from above, 
He did not understand. He left scratching his head. Very next chapter, John chapter 4. That was 3. John chapter 4, he goes to a well. Knowing there'd be a woman there. How do we know that? He told the disciples, you're not ready for this one. Go to H-E-B, get what we need. So he gets there, and there's a woman. A woman, strike one. Samaritan, strike two. She's about to strike out in adultery. Nicodemus left without any revelation. And here comes a Samaritan woman living in adultery because the man she was with hadn't put a ring on her finger. And she goes crying in John chapter 4, verse 29, telling the very crowd that caused her to go at midday, saying, come and see a man that has told me everything about me and tell me if this is not the Christ. What an amazing example of the kingdom. I mean, think about it. He just spoke with a religious ruler who received nothing of revelation. Very next chapter, tells the disciples, go on to the market, get what we need, I'm going to a place that you're not ready for. In fact, when they got there, they said, why is he speaking with a woman such as this? And the woman starts a revival and turns the city upside down when they finally came to see if he was the Christ. So again, historically, now, Historically, the Lord was not supposed to speak to women in public. Nobody else was there. The Jews had no ties whatsoever with Samaritans. To the Jew, they were dogs. They were nothing. So again, historically, you've got to understand the context of what the Lord is speaking so you can hermeneutically be able to have the interpretation. What does he mean? Over here, he's talking to a Jewish leader, giving him that of being born from above. And Nicodemus is like, I have no idea what you just told me. And this woman, religious, starts talking about, oh, well, this man, he's a pretty intelligent man. Starts saying, well, you Jews believe that in this mountain, but we believe that in this mountain. And our... Father gave us this well to be able to drink of. So she was throwing tidbits of truth. Till he finally said, okay, I'm going to give you a drink that you'll never thirst again. He said, Lord, give me that drink. And look at his evangelism. He didn't condemn her. He said, look, you, you're living in adultery. What's wrong with you? Blah, blah, blah like we hear today, he just simply said, go get your husband. He said, Lord, I have none. He said, yeah, you've had six, or you've had five, and this one, number six, is in him, but who was talking to her? Number seven. <laughs> Making her complete. See, historically, contextually, and hermeneutically, is the way you have to read Scripture. Or you'll tell people, you have to live this way, you can't do this anymore, can't do that anymore, and before, before you know it, you have taken things out of context, and you see more of the things that we labor after, which was the law, all over, and Jesus setting them free. So, rightly dividing Scripture. The history what was on the author's mind, telling what group, and then uh, contextually, what was the context. That's why Matthew 24 has confused so many people. He was talking about 
the end of the age, that generation that from 30 AD to 70 AD was going to finish. He was not talking about the end of the world. As a result, for the wrong interpretation, that's where they get dispensationalism. Okay, Gilbert. All right. Let it rip. So he just gives me the big bomb, right? Boom. This is what it means. All right, go ahead. Take it away. <laughs> no, I absolutely agree. Um, in, in my transition and understanding, um, when I went and started to, to search and study, I made a conscious decision. And I said, Lord, I want to start clean. I want to start clean. I want to know from your perspective, from your understanding, show me, right? And I, and I started to approach Scripture as if, as if I'm hearing it for the first time, okay? <laughs> because one of the, the, mm, one of the stumbling blocks to under, understanding Scripture is I already know it. Mm -hmm. Right? I already know that. I'm, I'm already very familiar with that. That's called pride. I already know that. Right? Mm -hmm. So I had to say, okay, Lord, I want to approach the word fresh <clears throat> as if I'm hearing it for the first time. Yeah. But this time I was aware of historical context, cultural context, hermeneutics, okay? These are a couple of things that, that, that we're going to write down. But there was, there was another thing, too, that really stood out to me, was that I started to notice, because you mentioned two, two passages, where part of their understanding was construed because they took things literal. Yeah. Nicodemus, or you mentioned Nicodemus, mm -hmm. right? What, 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 am I, what must I do to inherit the kingdom? He said, well, you must be born again. Literally, he's thinking... I'm going to get back in the womb. Yeah. It's exactly Literally. <clears throat> right? Yeah. And so, what does literally mean? What does that word mean? Literally. The word literally means like, it's an actual fact. This is the way it's actually going to happen. Okay? Mm -hmm. So with the woman at the well, right? I have a drink. I have a, 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 a river that you drink of this and eternal life. She was like, well, give me that. Give mm -hmm. me that water. Mm -hmm. She meant, she, she was taking it literally. Right? When Jesus said, drink from my blood, right? Eat of my flesh. John 6, yeah. They were disgusted <laughs> because they took it literally. Mm -hmm. And that's not what he was talking about. No. And, yeah, okay, Jesus says, I'm the vine. Is he literally a plant? No, he's not literally a plant. Jesus says, I'm, I'm the lamb. Is he really a lamb? Literally? No. So, so we have to see like there's literally, but a lot of the passages, a lot of things that Jesus mentioned or Paul or Peter, there are a lot of metaphoric language mm -hmm. that, that had that had cultural yeah. context, right? And what I mean by cultural is this, okay? A lot of, a lot of what we do is we, we approach Scripture through a Western culture, yeah. right? You, and usually what we mean by Western, what do we mean? We mean a U.S. kind of culture, mm -hmm. right? There's other cultures across the world, right? There's like the Asian culture and things like that. So we approach it Western, now, even in just, let's just say the U.S., in, in our Western culture, we have subcultures, right? Mm -hmm. We have the, the Latino-Hispanic culture, right? We have certain languages and statements and mm -hmm. phrases, metaphors that mean, yeah. that mean things that might not mean the same to a different culture, yeah. right? We also have the urban and hip-hop culture that they have their own language and come up with their own grammar, mm -hmm. their own meaning, their own ways of communicating. So just in the Western culture, right, the, the U.S., we have subcultures that, that within them have certain languages and certain tones, certain phrases, right, 
country western culture okay so when you look at even grammar in the bible they're speaking a certain culture right so as pastor was mentioning there is author uh relevance okay and reader relevance yeah okay so i'm going to write these two down because yeah those are, good um, points. Those are important mm -hmm. terms and concepts to really grasp okay there's they're, they're not just ideas that and being like okay that's a good point it's not just a good point it's something to grasp and really uh absorb that understanding that there is author relevance mm -hmm. that you have to approach scripture with author relevance okay in other words this is the person that is writing what's on their mind mm -hmm. when they're writing it yeah so what's on the writer's mind okay because i could write a letter to my wife right or i could write a letter to to my son but if you don't know what's on my mind when I'm when I when I wrote that letter, you could misinterpret what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It happens a lot during your text messages. Oh yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So yeah. we try to use emojis, <laughs> metaphors, to try to explain what we're trying to convey because we only have a limited vocabulary of what we're trying to say. So there's author relevance. What's on the writer's mind mm -hmm. when he's saying that, when he's writing it? And then another thing is what we'll call audience. I don't even know if I'm spelling it correctly, so I'm sorry. Audience relevance. This is also called reader relevance. So it's the same thing. It's the person that's receiving the letter. So what's on the reader's mind or the audience's mind? How are they receiving mm -hmm. what's being said? Is it relevant to their culture? It, it has, because it has to be, it's relevant to the author, but it has to be relevant to the person that's reading the letter. I cannot write you a letter about something I don't know that's going to happen 2,000 years from now. We have no grading concept for that. You understand what I'm saying? The person that was riding the horse to get to work can't write about a future car or airplane that doesn't exist. It's not in his mind yet. He can't comprehend that. There's no concept for that. Does that make sense? And so, we, so when reading the Bible, you have to look at what is the author trying to convey? What message are they trying to send out? And then the audience, put yourself in the audience when they're getting this letter for the first time, mm -hmm. what, what, are they, what are they supposed to be getting? What are they receiving? So remember, there's a lot of things that, are, that we take literally, and let me know if I'm spelling this correctly, literally, right? But there was a lot of things that, that Jesus talked about that was metaphorically. Mm -hmm. And let me know if I spelled this correctly. Metaphorically, right? What's a metaphor? When you're using something to describe something else, but they're totally different from one another, right? Sometimes we use phrases like, like man, I'm, I can eat a horse. <laughs> what does that mean? Does, does that mean literally like I want to eat a horse? No. It means I'm super hungry. Do you know what I mean? Why are you so quiet? Cat got your tongue? Does that mean that the cat really took my tongue? No. But imagine if somebody was reading this outside of our culture, right? And they're like, oh, man, did the cat really take their tongue? That's pretty sad. No. It, it's it's, it's a, an expression. You see? So in the Bible, there's a lot of expressions. There's a lot of metaphors. And sometimes we take those things literally. 
Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. Right? Jesus said this, this temple, that he was a temple. And the Jews are like, what do you mean you're the temple? The temple's right there. <laughs> it's right there. It's been here for a long time. It's not going nowhere. And Jesus is like, no. Set this temple down. In three days, I'll raise it up. Yeah. What are you talking about? It's right there. You can't never take this temple down. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So <clears throat> a lot of times we take our understanding and, and we, take, we take our understanding and we insert that into the Bible. So that right there is called, this is another thing that I, had, that I learned that really, really made me, more aware, made me more aware of what I was reading and how I, I was reading. Yeah. So listen to what I just said. It made me more aware of what I was reading, but also how I was reading it. And it's, and it's these two words here. I want to make sure I spell these correctly because they were very important <clears throat> when I started to see the differences. And that's I see Jesus. Okay. And another word is exegesis. This really helped me to be, not, I, I, don't, I don't want to say just like being open to, to understanding the, the, the word differently, but it, it just made me more aware. <clears throat> so I see Jesus is when you come in with your own thoughts and ideas and preconceived understanding like, this is what I heard it meant, so this is, this is what it's always going to mean. And so you take what you, what, what you think it means, and you insert that into the Bible. For example, like Pastor mentioned before, he's like, when we, when we read in the Bible that there is an eagle, we automatically assume that the eagle is the United States. Right? Because we have this idea that the, the eagle always represents the United States. So when I, when I go into the Bible, when I start reading, I'm like, oh, they're talking about the United States. I'm inserting my ideas mm -hmm. into the Bible. Okay? So this is my ideas or my understanding, my concepts, and I'm bringing them into the Bible. Okay? Yeah. Exegesis means I'm going to approach it as if this is my first time hearing it. And I want, to, I want the Bible, I'm going to pull, I'm going to extract. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I want to extract what the Bible is saying and let that change my understanding. So it changes my ideas. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So as, as Pastor mentioned, so author relevance or writer relevance, audience relevance also meaning <laughs> reader relevance. Then there's, as Pastor mentioned, there's the, his, the history, right? Because we talked about the culture. Okay. Culture was, was, uh, is a big thing to the Jews or to the Gentiles or... Right? You have also different Bible translations. You have so many different translations. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, for example, you have in the Bibles, you have words that have meaning in Greek. You have words that have meaning in Hebrew, right? Because it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. Or how do you say that? I spell A-R-A. A-R-A-M-I-C. -A Aramaic. <laughs> right? Aramaic. So the Bible is, so there's, there's, there's a, a multi-different facet of, of the word and words and grammar and metaphors and language. So there's a lot going on, right? And even, and as we mentioned, even culturally. Certain words and things mean different to different people. 
Okay? Now, one of the things about the Bible, too, is, um, for correct understanding, is that you have to let Bible interpret the Bible. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's one of the key things about hermeneutics, is if you read a passage somewhere in the Bible, there'll be a reference or a mention of that particular meaning or passage. And you can, you can cross-reference mm -hmm. the meanings <clears throat> yep. and what that meant. Okay? I don't want to get too much into detail. I just kind of want to elaborate on yeah. this because this That's is good. important about I see Jesus. And you can just have, see, like EI and EX, right? This is where you're inserting your thoughts. This is where you're extracting and letting the Bible influence your thoughts and ideas. Okay, so when I started to read the Bible, I was very aware of how I'm, I'm, I'm approaching it to, and reading it. Mm -hmm. Right? Because I was yeah. like, Lord, I don't want to come in with my own ideas of what I've already read, and I've, and I've gotten so familiar with these passages. And, I, uh, and I'll be honest, I went and bought another Bible. Because the Bible that I had was so highlighted, I was already, my, my mind was reading yeah. the Bible based on what I had already highlighted. Mm hmm do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. And so I was like, no, I'm going to go and re-highlight as if I'm reading it all for the first time. I'm going to chew this thing, okay? And then again, meditate. What does meditate mean? A lot of times we, we, we have this Eastern philosophy understanding of what it means to meditate. And I know there's people that are like, oh, we don't meditate, brother. We're Christians, you know? And that's not the original meaning of the word meditate. The word meditate is to to consume, chew it, right? And, and it's kind of like, like, I don't know, I mean, there's no other picture to paint, but it means to regurgitate, which is what, like what cows do, yeah. where they eat the food, it goes into one stomach, then they kind of like comes up, and then it goes into another stomach, they chew it again, comes up, and so it's just a constant. And so that's what it means to meditate, that I'm constantly chewing on it, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm sitting on it, and then I, I, I bring it back up, and I chew on it some more, and I'm going back and forth. So it's just not a one-time thing that you're just like, oh, I got it. Yeah. I got it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, and so Pastor was talking about how Matthew 24. <clears throat> People approach Matthew 24 and they start with, usually they start on verse 3. Let me just mm -hmm. verify. Yeah. I'm not going to go into too much detail. I just kind of want to start here because, I mean, I want to... Just finish with this thought. But in Matthew 24, verse 3, a lot of times when we talk about eschatology or the last days, mm -hmm. majority of the time they're going to start at Matthew 24, verse 3. <laughs> That's what they're going to take off from. And when you read it, I, don't have, I probably don't have the, right, the, uh, the same translation that's on the screen, but I'm just going to read the NIV. Um, it says, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Some translations it says at the end of the world or yeah. the end of the planet. So usually we start there, right? And already you start with, mm -hmm. I see Jesus. Yeah. Immediately you start to, oh, hey, I already know what's going to happen. There's going to be this, there's going to be that. And there's going to be this, this, and this, and this. And then they bust out all the sharks, right? Oh, yeah. There's this right here, and then this is going to happen, and boom, and everybody's going to be taken up. Cars are going to be crashing down here. And, there, and do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? So usually when we start Matthew 24, verse 3, we're already starting here already. And that's already a disadvantage. You're doing yourself a disadvantage already. Mm -hmm. When in reality, Matthew 24 Verse 3 doesn't start on verse 3. It actually starts in Matthew 23. Because we're talking about 
context. Mm -hmm. The thing is, context, context One of the stumbling blocks is that we have chapters and verses, right? Yeah. In the Bible, we have chapters, okay? And we have um, verses, okay? Have you ever gotten an email that was long and you're like, you know what, I'm going to read paragraph one today and then tomorrow I'll read paragraph two. And then maybe in a week, or a month, I'll read paragraph three of that letter or that email. No, usually you're going to sit down and you read the whole thing. That's context, right? You don't get an email that has chapter one, verse seven, and then chapter 25, verse three, and you're like, and then, and, and so you break up that email into chapters and verses, and if we do that, then, then you're not reading the whole thing as it was meant. To be read in the first place. Yeah. Am I making sense? Yeah. So this can disrupt the flow of how something was written on how the author intended for the reader to read it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, and that's what happens with Matthew 24, where the, the disciples Asking these three questions, you have to think, what prompted, what was in their mind, what prompted those disciples to ask those three questions? Mm -hmm. What was prompting in their mind to be like, tell us, when are you coming back? And what, when were those, these things happen? What things? What things are they talking about? What are they, what are they referencing about? What are they dialoguing about? Yeah. And what's the sign of the end of the world or the end of the age? How many of y'all heard this phrase that says, we live in the age of technology, mm -hmm. right? Or we live in the information age. What does that mean? When we talk about the age of technology or the information age, In the Greek, this word is A-I-O-N. Mm -hmm. And this word means a specific time period. Yep. And we use this word all the time. The age of information, it's a sp specific time period where information is just so much, right? Or the dark ages. Did you ever study the dark ages mm -hmm. in history or in class, the dark ages? It was referring to a specific time period. So when the disciples are asking, when is the end of the age? They're talking about a specific time period. Am I making sense? Mm-hmm. So when you go back and you read Matthew 23, you gotta, you got to be in the context, okay? Approach the passage as, you, yeah. as if you've never read it before. And I encourage you to do this. Ask the Lord to take you to the scene. I, I ask the Lord to take me to the scene. As I'm reading the passage, I want to feel as if I'm there. In that moment that it's happening, I want to feel the emotion of what's taking place, right? Historical context. I want to feel the wind. I want to smell the, 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 the aromas. I want, to, I want to touch the sand. I want to feel the sand in my toes as I'm reading the scriptures, okay? The Holy Spirit can use all my senses, all my five senses, mm -hmm. not just my, my brain, you understand what I'm saying? So when you read Matthew 23, you realize that they're actually in the temple. And Jesus is, is, is pretty 
He's, he's, he's laying it down to the Pharisees and Sadducees there. Woes and woes. And I think you have like seven woes. Yeah. Seven woes in there. Woe, you brood of vipers. And woe and woe and woe. And he's giving it to them. Matthew 23. So let's go back to Matthew 24, verse 1. Yeah. Let's start there. Okay? And we're going to read it. Verse 1 on Matthew 24. Jesus left the what? What does he leave? The temple. He leaves the temple. That's where he was at. Because he was talking to Pharisees, Sadducees, and all them that were around. So he's leaving the temple and was walking away when his disciples came to him to do what? To call his attention to what? To its buildings. Mm -hmm. So he's in the temple. They're leaving the temple. They're walking out. And the disciples tap him on the shoulder say, hey. And in verse 2, Jesus says, do you see all these things? What are the things that they're talking about? Their attention was to what? The temple. The temple. The building. You got to understand, the disciples just heard Jesus just woe and woe to you and woe to you and woe to you. And they're like, holy moly, what is going on? Jesus is not happy with these people. And so they tap and they give his attention and they look at the building. And Jesus is like, see all this? You see all this? See his buildings? You see all these things? I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every stone will be thrown down. Mm -hmm. So then they leave and they're on the mountain, right? The Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is a mountain that sees, if you're, if you're sitting on the Mount of Olives and you look, you could see it's right in front of you, right on that, right, right, been, right as you go down the mountain is the temple. So as they're sitting there, they're looking at the temple, they're pondering everything that Jesus just said, mm -hmm. they're pondering the thoughts of, you see, you see those stones? Not one's going to be left. It's all coming down. What? You're talking about the house of God is going to come down? How do you fathom that? How can you fathom? This is the presence, the glory. This is where God comes down and he meets his people. And mm -hmm. sins are forgiven for that whole year. Yeah. You're telling me that that's going to come down? So understand what, what in their culture, they're boggled. And so this is what prompts them to ask these three questions. Mm -hmm. yep. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now the questions, when you look at the historical context, yeah. the questions have a different meaning. Because we're not inserting it. We're not, I see Jesus. Now we're reading it with writer's mind and reader's mind in place. Yeah. Am I making sense? And so now, that's when the disciples ask the questions. Mm -hmm. As Verse 3. Let's yeah. go back. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. It was a private conversation. Tell us, when will this happen? What will happen? What were they talking about? About, about that building coming down. When is that going to happen? Because mm -hmm. that's huge. Temple coming down? This world is yeah. going to be upside down if that temple comes down. That's yeah, a thank you, Gilbert. There. Their culture uh, was that the temple was the merging of heaven and earth. Heaven and earth. It wasn't just a building. That's heaven and earth together. And what did Jesus declare? Heaven and earth is about to be wiped away. And their culture, what was heaven and earth? The holy place and the holy of holies. It wasn't heaven and earth. Yeah wiping away their cultural context their grammar the metaphors yeah all that has a very significant role in understanding scripture yeah does that make sense and, and so, Jerusalem was a holy city the holy city it wasn't just San Antonio River City mm -hmm. this was 
the holy city. This was in their, in their minds, in their growing up, and their traditions and mm -hmm. the the understandings in their readings yeah. from the Psalms to the law to the words of the prophets. Mm -hmm. That would never happen yeah. to God's city. And Jesus is saying, no, that temple is going to come down. Really? Mm -hmm. When? When? When is it going to happen? And when it does, tell me, give me a sign. Because I want to make sure that I'm not around for this. I want to make sure I'm not around for this. So how do I know? Give me a clue when this is going to happen. When will this happen? And what will be the sign of you coming and of the end of a specific time period? Age, generation. That age, meaning the age of Moses. That law of Moses is coming to an end. They knew exactly what it meant that that temple was coming down. They knew exactly yeah. what it meant. It was mm -hmm. very, very significant. Yeah. And, um, and then in verse 4, after that, Jesus begins to tell them, he begins to answer the, their, their three questions. But the thing is, you cannot, you cannot exit Jesus, Matthew 24. You have to icy Jesus. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. You cannot icy Jesus. You cannot insert our cultural Western yeah. ideas, philosophy, and all that. You cannot icy Jesus, Matthew 24. You can't. You have to exit Jesus, yeah. Matthew 24, mm -hmm. in the correct context and historical environment. And I'll tell you this. If you have time or if you have the opportunity and you really want to know what Jesus was referring to about Matthew 24, study what, what I had never heard of before in my whole Christian uprising. And that was called the Jewish Revolt. Sometimes it's called the Jewish Roman War. Sometimes it's called the first. And I say that because there were three important revolts that the Jews were against the Romans. Okay? This is a very significant time in history. And this was from 67 AD, and it lasted all the way to 73 AD. In between here is 70 AD. Yeah. That's when that temple that said one stone would not be left upon another. Mm -hmm. That's when it happened. In 70 AD. But if I would have not never ever heard of the Jewish revolt and the or also known as the, the Jewish Roman War, I would not have never had any understanding on this. But because we never heard the historical context, historical events, mm -hmm. we've never heard of them. It completes, we completely read the scriptures, and it goes over our, our understanding. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. I think I'm over my time. Go ahead, Pastor. Anything you want to add? No, well, an example where it says wars and rumors of wars are American culture. So look, look at all the wars we've had. No, in that time that Jesus spoke, there'd be wars and rumors of wars. There were no wars. Nobody was dumb enough to come against Rome. Rome was an empire. You could not, you could not penetrate. You could not do anything to Rome. It was, I mean, that was an empire. And, uh, you know, good luck trying to do it. So at that time that the Lord spoke that, they're thinking, hmm, again, culturally, what wars is he talking about? There's total peace right now mm -hmm. because Rome has already practically defeated everyone in this area. 
and no one's coming against them. Mm -hmm. They hadn't seen wars for years. For now, the Lord saying there'll be wars and rumors of wars. Today, people talk about, you know, they're, they're the Christ, Jesus in, incarnate again. But in those days, they took advantage of what occurred. And because the temple was destroyed, now there was no record to prove otherwise that you weren't the Messiah. So many false Christs came. So like Gilbert said about the eagle, by the way, we think, ah, that's America, the bear, oh, that, that's Russia, whatever. That's not the right interpretation because that word eagle is translated also vulture. And on the, on the armory of the Roman soldiers, there were vultures. But somebody gets the translation eagles, ah, that's America. So, that's rightly, yeah, rightly dividing Scripture is so important. Mm -hmm. So, pray y'all got something out of this, that y'all enjoyed it as much as Gilbert and I enjoyed bringing it forth. Uh, again, don't forget this Friday, yep. uh, you do not have to pre-register on coatc.org, uh, mm -hmm. Church of Acts Teaching Center, um, .org, if you're just going to watch it on Facebook or YouTube. Yeah, you it's only for that. those that are coming. But even if you're a part of this house, I want you to register for the sake of headcount of how many we can house. So that's Friday, 7, Saturday, 11, 7, and then Sunday, 11. So again, Dub Alexander is uh, basically has a ministry, uh, School of Kingdom Prophets, mm -hmm. which is totally different than just prophetic. And he's basically taken the, the positioning of Miles Monroe going to the nations and bringing solutions. And then uh, Michael Dalton has a tremendous legacy that his great-grandmother goes all the way back to the time of Azusa. So uh, he's got an amazing testimony. So you don't want to miss it. Uh, so again, we're excited about it. We've been preparing for it. And um, we just know that it's going to be a very, very timely thing for us to receive what God has for us. So again, as Gilbert said, thank those that have come tonight, all of you that have been watching us, especially those of you that are so faithful, and we just pray that you're grasping this, this uh, way of reading Scripture historically, contextually, and hermeneutically. And when you do, it's going to change the way you think. It did to me. Now, I'm the pastor of this church. And I'll tell you, there were years that my interpretation was totally wrong. I'd pick a topic and I'd bring scriptures to back it up when those scriptures never were in that same context. Don't worry, I've repented to the church before, so no problem, but we're on the good page now. So God bless and see you Friday.